Dr. Holtmans. Thanks a lot. I'm quite happy to be here to see so many people interested in mobile phone security. So the talk will be basically having two parts um, because most of you are actually not from the mobile phone industry. So I will explain to you how business is done in mobile phone industry, what we are facing there, what we are seeing there. And the second part of the talk, I will talk about really the attack scenarios. We will go into Wireshark protocol details and so on. So we will have a sort of split talk. Um, hold on, okay. So I'm in from industrial research. Um, now you might ask, okay, do I see now a small advertisement? No, you will not. Um, but industrial research has some advantages. Um, I went to industrial research and left the academy because I really wanted to do real stuff. And the advantage is I get, I really get to see the customer data. I see the pickup files and also sort of when I understand the stuff, I can go to the product units and tell them, hey, this is shit, please do it differently. So I really can make an impact and change things. Um, the, on the downside, I cannot go to a talk like this here and say, the industry should fix this. No way, I will get beaten up. Um, I need to come up with all the solutions. And solutions that are, can be, are worth the money, I cannot just say, well, invent mobile phone networks, new. So that's, that's not an option for a chief financial officer, so I cannot come up with these kind of solutions. Um, also shareholders don't like that. So I have to come back with things, how to fix things without sort of really fully breaking them. So that's industrial research. So on the one side, there's a bit of plus, but on the other side, well, I also have to think about the financial aspects. Um, so let's go into the technology a bit. So roaming. Many people here are, let's say, from Asia. So you have subscriptions from China Mobile, from Airtel, from Megaphone in Russia, or Telenor in Pakistan. But you are here in US. That means that you most likely connect to AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, or Sprint. And I'm from Finland, which means I have a subscription from Elisa, but they are also Telia and DNA. So, and the idea is that you switch on your phone, you go to another country, and it works. And it's very, actually it's surprising that it works, even if you don't, because, I mean, these are different business entities. I mean, they are different countries which don't like each other, potentially, and still it works. Anybody can call anybody and it works. And this is due to the so-called roaming network or interconnection network. It's a big network. On the slides you see the main undersea water cables. And it's very, very big. There are some hubs, for example, in Great Britain are some hubs, in Frankfurt are some hubs, on the west coast and east coast are some hubs. So. And the routing based through this network is based on pricing, so on the money. So the cheapest route wins. So this is actually how the network operators communicate with each other when you set up a call, an international call or any sort of communication. And you can think about it, there's no single controlling entity, which is sort of the most interesting point. There's not a government agency controlling all of that. They're all independent, all different governments, Regulations, everyone has its own regulation. So it's a very mixed network. So when you switch, when I switch on my phone, here, it connects probably to some of the antennas. I suppose that most of the hotels here have some base stations, some antennas on top of it. And then it goes to the local core network of the operator here, a big of bunch of servers, AT&T or Verizon or whoever I connect to. And they don't know me, who I am, somebody strange from Finland. Okay, can we give that person a service? So what happens then? They basically send a message first to UK over this undersea cable, and then from this IPX carrier to the Frankfurt, most likely, and then to Finland. And Finland, my home network, then says, yep, corporate subscription, data flat rate, don't worry, will be paid. And also checking the authentication credentials. So we'll come back to that picture later on when I go about the fraud attack. 
So let's talk a bit about the network. Um, this secret network. Well, so to understand the security problems that we face there, you need to understand basically where this network is coming from. And uh, this network was invented in the Nordic countries in Europe, and we do business there slightly different. I will sort of, that's a business meeting in Finland. It's actually from Kalpalehti, and it's really a business meeting. It's a young entrepreneur meeting in that case. Uh, I had the, got the copyright for that picture sort of from the nice newspaper. That, and, but I'm pretty sure that the first Nordic operator meeting in 1981 was looking like that. I'm 100% sure, or as my colleagues told, too, 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 too close to the truth. So Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and Iceland, and they had pretty serious problems. So they had problems like they wanted to talk to each other to exchange vital information like temperature of sauna, is the beer already cold? So they had really serious issue. So they decided let's set up a, that our networks talk to each other. And then they were going into some technical problems, sort of, okay, underwater cables are needed and uh, still worrying about the beer. And then they were sort of, let's get down to the details. Um, <laughs> I, I've been in such meetings myself, so they are really like that. It's, it's, not, it's actually no joke. <laughs> um, so they were discussing then sort of, okay, protocols are needed. Do we need security? Ah, uh, no, not needed. We are all know each other. We are just five countries. Um, and so that's how basically the this network was instantiated. Um, that was about 35 years ago, and it was built on trust. And a lot of no stuff in Nordic countries works on trust. Um, they had the signaling system number seven protocol, and that was used on the communication between the networks. And, and nowadays we move from signaling system seven to the 4G protocols like Diameter for LTE. So, summary, five Nordic operators, and it's very mixed membership. So you have, for example, this is here from Amazon, that's, um, where they send you a one-time password via an SMS. So this is an SMS ag aggregator, they are called. They send you these messages. So it's also connected to the interconnection network. And also the networks themselves are very mixed. For example, there is .tv. People probably know that ending. It's for Tuvalu. Tuvalu is an island in the Pacific. It has telecommunication network. And they have 47 employees and 1,300 subscribers. And are happy probably about everybody who is born there, sort of because then they have one subscriber more. On the other hand, we have, for example, China Mobile, which has roughly uh, half a million employees and 873 million subscribers. So it's quite different to the uh, homogeneous structure in the beginning, where there were just basically every Nordic country has about five to seven million people. So we have now a lot of different entities in there, and I'm pretty sure that the Tuvalu telecommunication doesn't have a lot of security experts, maybe one if they are lucky. China Mobile has probably money for some more. So, well, and the network itself, it's nowadays a mix and match of everything. So as we had in the morning talks or yesterday in the Qualcomm talk, and also, in 2014, we had our first major incidents. Security awareness basically started then. And now you might think, okay, I'm not roaming, I'm not traveling, why should I give something about it? So, well, <clears throat> I'm sorry, because with all those connected IoT devices and self-driving cars and webcams and whatever, they use cellular stuff. So, so there we are. So we need this kind of thing. So also emergency car systems and so on. So you are always reachable from the interconnect network just in case somebody wants to call you. Somebody's going off your friends is going to a vacation and wants to call you. So you're always reachable from this interconnection network. 
So, security. Uh, let's go first, sort of, who would hack this network? Oh, nobody would hack this network. What, why should you hack this network? Okay, there are sort of different types of hackers. In this talk, we will fo focus on fraudsters, but the other ones are also sort of in this too. So, we have um, had some, in there are the first one in the corner is uh, location tracking, so something like track your spouse service. Uh, the one below is where there were, uh, getting one-time passwords for the bank accounts in Germany. Um, actually, that operator was quite quick. They, within a couple of hours, they noted that something fishy is ongoing and managed to stop that. But, of course, um, it get, got into the press and then oh, some damage was done. But actually, they were quite quick compared to other incidents. So... And then there are um, governmental agencies. I think in the morning we heard a long talk from the NSA that uh, everybody else hacks the mobile phone network. I'm afraid they also do. Um, this is also GCHQ, that is the UK agencies, but um, I also get locks on my table and I've seen many other countries. But on the other hand, you never know exactly where the attacks are coming from. You just see an IP address and you know nothing. So and then there are so-called service companies. Um, there are darknet service companies, and there are governmental service companies, because not every government develops the um, offensive stuff themselves. They also very often just buy it from third parties as product, as services. So these guys you find in the network, in that interconnection network. So these are the attacks that exist nowadays for SS7, and that's location tracking, eavesdropping, fraud, denial of servers, the cryptographic key theft, data sessions that's actually GDP and not SS7, and SMS interception is probably most important because that means that these are your one-time passwords for WhatsApp, for, well, not WhatsApp, for Telegram, Facebook, and so on. So, but it's important to understand that not networks are equal. They are not all equal. So some have protection measures in place, some have nothing in place, and some have something in place. So, so you start wondering, okay, if that's a closed and private network, how would get those guys actually get in? Well, um, we saw you can rent it as a service. It's not so expensive, so um, you just go to the dark net and rent it. You can fraud SMS interception, for example, or voice interception, you can rent it. You can, some governments have a very close relationship with the operator. You must remember that the government approves the license spectrum. So if the government doesn't like the operator, the operator doesn't have a license to operate, making money. So basically it's <laughs> then. So some, op some governments use this. Uh, to get access to the IPX network um, or sort of convincing them. And the other way is sometimes you see nodes, mobile telecommunication nodes, which shouldn't be on the internet, but they are on the internet. You can find them in Shodan. If you know what you look for, you can find those nodes on Shodan. Somebody just put them on the internet because they wanted to put a web server on it or they wanted to work remotely from home and want to have some convenient access because they didn't want to be 24 hours in the office. So another way is to become an operator. That's a pretty cool thing. You go to an operator, to an existing operator, and say, hey, I want to have, I want to become a virtual network operator for um, logistic fleets. Let's say, let's say Hertz or sort of some rental car agency, Hertz or something, and you want to be a sort of service provider. In Europe, they have to give you the access then, because it's, else it's anti-competitive, this um, antitrust thing. So, because for competitive reasons, they have to give you access. So, and then there are, of course, the classical ways. You can be bribing an employee. You can do social engineering and so on. So, well, you might say, okay, this is all press and this is not true. And, oh, this is just, but actually this year I found very interesting. Um, that was, uh, I did that, as you see, in June. That's from Shodan, and that's a scanner that crawled through the internet and looking for other nodes that talk GTP. 
Now you need to know that GTP, GPRS tunneling protocol, it's really just a telco protocol. It's really only spoken in telco. Nobody else in internet speaks GTP. So, um, and it has a lot of ports open like that. So, so uh, I've been discussing with my colleagues, so if there's a legitimate reason they can think of why this thing would be in the internet. And we couldn't come up with an idea. Maybe, maybe somebody has a smart idea, but well, at least nobody in our unit had a good idea why this would be on the internet. Okay, now we move to from the old protocol, SS7, to the new protocol. And you can ask, okay, new protocol, everything is better. We no longer have any problems and new protocol, diameter LTE. And in this talk, we will focus on the fraud part, but it can be very easily used for denial of service because if you improve somebody's service, you can easily, the same way, put it down. Uh, when I switch on my phone, I said, uh, I connect to the antenna and then the local operator here in the US wants to know um, basically if I pay my bills, what kind of services are I'm allowed, I'm allowed to have 4G or not. And so what they do then, they contact over the S9 interface, the my home operator and ask for the uh, quality of service rules that I have and for the policy and charging rules. So now you see a mobile call network. Don't be too afraid of it. It looks awful. So, so but you, we only will use those nodes which I just highlight here. My colleague Isha, who is not able to come today, she will talk you through it in a minute. So these are the nodes. And the other ones we will not talk about. Just ignore them. So there are Sorry, you have still quite some nodes there, but mobile networks are extremely complex, and this is only 4G. Now imagine that you have all the other types of network also plugged into it. Um, so this is actually the network we use also for testing. So as I said, I work for a company, and we cannot just roll out software to our customers. If we screw up their network, they don't make money, and they are very unhappy with us if they don't make money. So what we have, we have internal test networks, and this is some software of it that we use for testing software rollouts so that we are sure that we don't screw up our customers' networks. So, and that we used also for, for testing of this attack. So, so this is here the LTE emulator and my code Isha. A software implementation of LTE network designed by Nokia as per 3GPP specifications. This is the basic architecture of EPS where UE user equipment is connected to the EPC over EU TRAN. The evolved node B is the base station for LTE radio. MME is the mobility management entity handles signaling related to mobility and security for the EU TRAN access. HSS home subscriber server is the database that contains user related and subscriber related information. S gateway serving gateway serves the UE by routing the incoming and outgoing IP packets. PDN gateway is the point of interconnection between the EPC and the external IP network. PCRF policy and charging rules function supports service data flow detection, policy enforcement, and flow based charging. Diameter S9 interface is between HPCRF and VPCRF responsible for PCC rule installation, modification, and removal. Okay, to make it less painful, um, my suggestion would be is you focus on the S9 and the PCRF. The PCRS is basically everything sort of related to policy and charging. So that's a policy and charging rule functions. This, this thing, this box controls basically uh, what you are allowed to do or not to do in your network. So basically it interprets the rules on, on what kind of um, activities and services you can use with your with your subscription. All the other nodes in there, they also have tasks like database, mobility, and IP assignment, and so on. So basically, you can just ignore them for now. So focus on the PCRF. That's with regard to charging and billing. The 
ah, so ah. so sorry it shouldn't start again so basically you can think about the ipx that all those networks with their nice infrastructure connect to each other via this ipx and using the s9 interface to communicate these kind of charging related things with each other so this is currently diameter is currently rolled out in this ipx networks and S9 is not the most common interface. The most common interface is the S6A interface, but still S9 is a roaming interface and it's critical in the sense that if something goes wrong there, um, then it directly relates to monetary aspects and potential loss of money. Sorry, that was. So basically here's a sort of summary of it and we will talk about here about this S9 where we talk to the rest of the world. Um, that's how the emulator looks like. Nisha will briefly show you the emulator and the different nodes, which the most important is the PCRF. These are the highlighted LTE emulator nodes, UE control plane process, UE user plane process, ENB control plane, ENB user plane, MME, S gateway, HSS, PCRF, P gateway, UE is connected to ENB through the attach statement. As soon as we attach, we can see the MZ number of the UE on all the nodes and HSS, PCRF on P gateway as well as on the S gateway. So that's basically the emulator we use with all the uh, virtual nodes in there. And this is actually the normal message flow. Remember the picture with the, with the flags? So basically first the visited network, in this case it would be US, would be asking my home network sort of, okay, does she have credit? Yes or no? And what kind of service is this person allowed to use? This is then in the CCR message, it's a credit control request and then the credit control answer. These are standardized public documents. Everybody can read them. They are on 3GPP servers. Um, then, then the home network can do, it's optional, it doesn't need to, but it can send a re-authentication request. And basically this is, for example, useful in the case that my subscription has been canceled because I've been laid off because I gave a speech to DEF CON. Um, so for this case, the home network can give a re-authentication request and say, ha, cancel the subscription. So this is the purpose of the message, that's how it's supposed to work, but we will show now how we basically can tweak that into a fraud attack. So what is a PCC? It's a policy and charging control. It's everybody in this room has a PCC. Um, it defines everything about your subscription, the data types, the data rate, what kind of seller services you use or not. For example, for kids, they might have a subscription without data or things like that. That's all in this PCC, nicely defined. And for example, I work for a company. So I'm a quite generous subscription. I work for a phone com mobile phone company or not mobile phone company, but a supplier of it. So, well, they pay my bills. So no matter how much data I use, so basically I have a flat rate. And this is very attractive for an attacker. So because, well, Company policies are complex things, so if they steal my subscription, basically, uh, it probably takes a while to pop up in the system till somebody rings somebody and saying, here's something fishy, if they notice at all. Um, but before we go into the attack, I will explain something about diameter routing. Um, because diameter routing, there are two ways to route. And basically, if an attacker sends something, um, and basically pretends to be the home network and puts in the origin realm, let's say my Finnish operator and sends it to US. Then it goes via these hops. And actually the answer, there are two ways for the answer to be routed. Either it's routed by origin realm and origin host, which is sort of slightly more complicated because all the intermediate nodes have to configure it. Or what also sometimes happens, that they round by hop by hop by D which means that basically the origin realm, and so it's completely ignored 
meaning that somebody can very easily impersonate the home network. And no, there's no TLS and no IPsec, just to avoid the question, so it's not there. So it's very easy, if the routing is done hop by hop, to spoof messages. It's, so um, the attack, what we will do, we will steal a subscription from a subscription, a good subscription, like my subscription, the PCC, that's a string. And once we know this string, this key string, we will update another subscription with this string. So basically that means we upgrade the other subscription to a Nokia subscription. So suddenly Nokia has an employee more. I'm not sure they're happy about that, but <laughs> so that's how it goes. Um, remember IPX was designed without security and we have two possibilities. So once we pose as a home network, so if there's no proper configuration there, which is sometimes the case, yes, um, you can pose as a home network and send messages to my home network, the attacker. So and for that you need the IMSI. The IMSI, I will not go into details how to catch the IMSI, but you might have heard of stingrays. I think they're commonly used in US. Then there's the possibility to get them from a wireless LAN exit point that was shown in Black Hat 2016. Or you can request them also from this interconnection network in, with an SMS trick, basically. Basically, you claim you have an SMS that you want to deliver, and then you get the IMSI. Uh, so there are some ways to get the IMSI, so we will not go into that how you get. Actually, for the tests, we actually had a fourth base station in, in Helsinki, and uh, we're testing it. It works nicely. Um, before any questions come, it's legal. Nokia is even an operator, so... <laughs> so just to avoid questions, so we just did it on site, on our test site. Um, so what we will do, we send a re-authentication request with the MZ, and then we will basically say we want to have the PCC. And here's how it works. UE is attached when VPCRF triggers the RAR, that is re-authentication request message, the HPCRF replies with RAA, that is re-authentication answer. The message can be captured and viewed through Wireshark. Okay, and that's an... UE uh, is... Okay, yeah. Here's the Wireshark part. On Wireshark, we can see diameter packets. The RAR consists of quality of service and charging rules it's for smaller. the respective UE. Okay, I see that's a bit small. Um, actually, just above the blue line, the, the one that's moving right now. The highlighted are the PCC rules for UE1, which can be seen on the diameter captured packets also. So what we basically know then, we know the key string that's behind basically describing my subscription, that are the yellow marked strings. So these strings define actually what services I'm allowed to be use or not to use. So these strings are the key strings, and we don't actually know what's behind them, but we don't need to know because we just know, okay, company employee, they pay. So, and the next step is then to push these strings to another subscription and basically upgrade that subscription. And that's how you up upgrade it. So what you do is, over the S9 interface, you say quality of service rule install. And the answer, you don't even need this diameter routing trick because you just want to push something and want the receiving network to install the stuff. And that's what it's do. It's supposed to do that. So as I explained, this message is usually for the case that my subscription is canceled or something, or something on my subscription changes, and the home network wants to inform the other network that uh, the service has been now changed. So it's, it's supposed to do that, so. And there's another one where you can go if you are abroad, so that in the network when you go abroad, there the mess, your quality of service or your services are changed. That's the other trick. So there are two scenarios basically for the attack. One way in the home network the stuff is changed and one way in the visited network the stuff is changed. And that's how it looks like. 
After changing the PCC rules for the UE1, when VPCRF triggers the RAR message again, now we can see the changed PCC rules through the capture Wireshark. Okay. And here's a Wireshark where you basically can, well, not sure you can see it. Well, let's see. Here we have captured the latest RAA message packet and we can see the changed PCC rules. Here we have captured the latest RAA message. Packet. Okay, sorry, there was a duplication slide. So basically, that's an, um, uh, a screenshot of the of the change. In the in the top, you see that the numbers are differently, and the bottom we set them all the same. So actually, that's what to be more a denial of service type of attack. So, but we can switch it one way or the other way. It doesn't matter basically. We just need to know what the strings are looking like and we can sort of put them to any subscription as we like. So if we can do denial of service or we can upgrade in subscription, whatever we want to do. So, so what does it mean? Uh, the attacker, he can offer better services. So in the sense that he upgrades basically somebody else's subscription and shifting the cost to somebody else and letting somebody else potentially pay for the phone bill. There's also this reselling opportunity, as I said, if somebody goes abroad and you can sell basically free data for somebody going abroad. Um, in Europe, this is not so interesting, but in, let's say, between US and Canada, I heard, or let's say to the Caribbean, where the costs are sometimes very high up for roamers. That might be interesting. Or if you go on a cruise, they are famous for robbing people. Um, so for users, that might be that you're built for something that you actually didn't do. So, and particularly for company subscriptions, this is very critical because they have often large amounts of people and they might not be able to keep track of everybody. So that's, that's an issue until this is found. For the operator, that means there could be bill disputes, um, loss of corporate customers, and also remember this way the messages were routed through UK and Germany and so on. Each of those guys in between get a bit of the cake. So each one of them gets a bit of money for, for messages and so on and for data traffic also. So if there's a fraudulent data traffic usage, those guys in the middle, they still want to get their money, believe me. So it's really bad in the sense that you might lose really money on it. Um, countermeasures, I said in the beginning, um, I don't have the luxury of saying, hey, so I cannot say, mm, no, I cannot, I cannot say switch it off or build the network from scratch. That doesn't work. So this is a huge network. It's cost hell of a lot of money. And also I just have to acknowledge the realities. There's this Tuvalu operator with 47 employees. I cannot expect those guys to, or 1,300 um, employees, uh, subscribers, I cannot expect those guys to pay a lot of money for a very specific security feature. And also there's no central authority which could regulate the everything. US is regulating somewhat in form of recommendations. Uh, but in the morning, for example, in the DHS talk, we heard already basically a plea for help where, because they don't, well, these are privately owned companies and for them it's a risk question between risk, how much something worth and how much they have to spend on the money. So, but on the other hand, there are some countermeasures which sort of kill a lot. Might not be 100% foolproof, but already help a lot. So actually the operators themselves and the GSMA, that's the operator association, they have thought about these things, at least to some degree. So in particular to this attack, um, S9 interface, well, you can use IPsec. Diameter runs on top of IP. So you can use it with trusted partners directly and not with all these hop by hop thingies. So it's at least very useful for partners which have a lot of interaction. I suppose that there's a lot of interaction between US and Canada, for example, or US and Mexico. 
for those communications, it's quite worthwhile to have set up this IPsec tunnel. I'm not sure it's worthwhile setting up an IPsec tunnel to Tuvalu. That's probably not worth the effort. So for those kind, you might just say, okay, I take the risk. Um, then S9 interface, it should only be open if it's really needed. Might be obvious to IT people, but for, uh, for telcos, that's not so. IT, we are still sort of learning a lot, let's put it that way. Um, then on the routing part, so to make the attacker's life hard, the routing should be by origin realm and origin host, not by hop by hop by D. Then there are things that are more telco specific. Um, IMSI range. Remember, IMSI is the um, user identity in the mobile network. It's not your phone number, it's IMSI. And each operator has assigned a range which is he's supposed to use. So you can basically check if this is really from that operator or not. This avoids, for example, these kind of governmental attacks, makes it harder. Um, one important thing is also to check that you don't get messages which can seem to come from your own nodes. Um, other one, logical separation in the nodes of your visited incoming roamers and your home subscribers. So to have them separated and not just if a request comes in and you just execute it with no feeling if it makes sense or not. And then there's a location distance check where you can basically check if somebody can physically be here. So if I've been two minutes ago, I had the last location update in, in Finland, I cannot have five minutes later a charging message here in US. That's just not feasible. So, and then there is sort of more advanced stuff like fingerprinting partners. So you can take the traffic, throw it into very nice machine learning, sort of magic magic, and sort of, because e each partner has a specific way to send messages, to configure them, which features they support, and so on. And by that, you can sort of fingerprint the traffic. And these flows, you can easily then sort of identify and see if there is something strange in there. And that moment, you can sort of raise some flex. So this is not rocket science. And, but it helps a lot and it can be put on a running network without sort of too big costs. For normal users, check your bill and keep an eye on the news. That's my best suggestion. Um, for corporate users, um, in general, I think security should be something like bandwidth or coverage because it's a quality thingy. Security doesn't come for free. I'm paid, most of you are somehow paid, so we don't work for free. We are experts in our fields. And it's the same with bandwidth, people which blow up the bandwidth and invented 5G, the radio part, they get also paid. So I think it's a quality indicator and it should be part of business contracts because if something goes wrong, it usually costs money. So this is something very important to understand and also sort of if things go wrong, so that there's also some punishments for not investing properly into security. Um, in the GSMA, there are recommendations, more details if operators are interested in it. And that's basically the end of my talk. So this has been partially funded by the EU. They do this kind of research and that's it. Thanks a lot. So I, I can take some questions. This gentleman there. Okay, that is so not gonna work. Come. Yeah. Um. Hi, I was wondering about the billing. So you mentioned that this uh, this could potentially build, be billed to the company or to a user, different subscriber, but it looked like the only thing that was being changed was the uh, level of service given to a different user, right? Yeah. Uh, so how does it affect the billing of someone else? Um, 
So the question was about sort of how it affects the um, bill of somebody else. If you, in the case you have group subscriptions like co corporates have, then um, it affects somebody else bill. But it can also sort of, I could upgrade your or downgrade your subscription basically to a denial of service attack. So that's the other way around. But for somebody else bill, that would be the corporate case and the individual case would be denial of service basically. So. I could basically keep downgrade you to 2G forever. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, I was just curious um, how. Pres oh. Okay, ho hold on. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, that's question, yeah. yeah, okay. I was curious um, how persistent is that change? Like, when would that get reset? Uh. The question was how persistent is that change? Um, let me think. For the visited case, it would be persistent for the time that you are brought. And, hmm? The time the handset is on the network. Yeah, yeah, the time the handset is on registered on the network in the foreign network. For the home network, that's a good question. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be needed sort of to distribute through the network to be persistent. Yes, it is sort of quite a pain. <laughs> yeah. And yes, gentlemen. There. Yeah. What's the fastest mobile network speed you've seen on a phone, or just in general? I don't measure the network speed, honestly. So. Looking more at the security at the back end, so thanks a lot.